Welcome to Sheboygan County Government, working for you. My name is Adam Payne, Sheboygan County Administrator and co-host of this program with Chairman Mike Vandersteen. And uh, hopefully you're at home and comfortable and weren't recently out on those roads. Of course, it's that time of year when it can be a real adventure driving the roads in Sheboygan County, but we're fortunate to have Mr. Greg Schnell with us today, the Highway Commissioner, to tell us a little bit about the Highway Department as well as give some tips on how to improve your safety. Greg, welcome. Thank you. Greg and his team have been doing a remarkable job, I think, this winter, keeping those roads clear and safe. Uh, we thought we got through a difficult winter in 2008, and it looks like 2009 may bring on the same. Greg, how long have you been the Highway Commissioner? I started in October of 2006, so I've uh, lived through the couple of the toughest winters that we've seen in quite some time. And when we talk about seasons, there's really two primary seasons with the Highway Department. Please start by sharing a little bit about what the seasons are for the Highway Department. We like to call it the two seasons. Everybody else goes through four, we go through two, construction and winter. Um, those seasons can vary and uh, obviously one goes into the other. We've been running into that, that our construction season has been uh, uh, getting more and more longer and getting closer to winter and a lot of the equipment that we use for construction we need to use for the winter. So it's, it's, a, it's a unique time for us to make that transformation back from construction to winter every year and it's always some, sometimes be as a challenge is trying to get all of our work done and complete and ready for everybody's driving conditions in the winter and in the summer. So for most of us, it's winter, spring, summer, and fall. But for those of you at the highway department, it's the construction season or it's the winter season. That's correct. How would you go about describing, give our viewers a flavor of what those two seasons entail? Well, it's always a, a, a prediction for us for the winter as far as how we plan for our operations. And I mean, as far as having enough salt and materials to provide those safe driving conditions as we need to throughout the winter. Um, those plans go into place in July. We check our inventories that's left over from the year before and then we gauge our, our salt inventories on what's left and what we're going to need or what we're forecasting for our winter. Um, as we swing out of the winter and we prepare for the summer we obviously have to have our barricades in place and our traffic control procedures in place for our construction projects and, and have the materials that we need to do our maintenance and our construction throughout those two seasons. So. So when you move from the construction season, which ends approximately? We go right up until deer hunting at this, uh, at this point. This year we, we just got done in time to get everybody away for deer hunting and make sure everything was okay. And then is there a, a big changeover of the equipment that you're using, putting plows on? What, what's, what's that transition entail? We have to uh, mount our, our trucks. We have triaxle trucks that haul our gravel and asphalt in the, in the summer months. We make those into snow removal equipment, so we put a plow, sander, and a wing on. Um, we have to make sure all that stuff, obviously, it's been sitting all summer long, the wing and the plow, so it has to be operable and going through the hydraulics and the line, lines and all that stuff. So, And we also have graders that are utilized in the summer and also need to be used in the winter, so we have to add on their attachments to take care of the winter also. And then when the winter ends, Take it all off and start all over. And start all over. From time to time, uh, Mike and I will get calls, and I'm certain you do, about, you know, boy, what's our winter budget like, and do we have enough salt left to, to take care of things adequately? On average, you know, I don't know if an average snowfall is two, three inches. What roughly does that cost Sheboygan County taxpayers to get that snow removed and those roads safe? Depending on the timing of things, um, obviously if it's on a weekend, um, which would generate a lot more uh, overtime involved, you know, th those storms could run anywhere between fifty to sixty thousand dollars, and depends upon how much salt is used. Um, we track a storm. Everybody else tracks a storm as far as when it starts to snow and stops to snow. We track a storm as when the st uh, storm starts to when the wind stops blowing normally, which was, is after the, after the snow comes. So now we have to go back and it entails drift control and widening in order to make room for additional snow. So um, it can range uh, even larger than that if we have to bring out the larger pieces of equipment such as the graders and ultimately if we need the Oshkosh trucks, which we have 12 of those in our arsenal also, to do the, the heavy widening and the, or the heavy lifting, if you will. So fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 on a weekend. What about during the week? Uh, you could get by with probably about 35000 Okay, so it gives folks a, a flavor for just how expensive it is. I know years ago when it snowed, for me it was 
you know, you think about how pretty it is or getting home and sledding with your kids or whatever, but now I find whenever it snows, I'm going cha-ching, because I just know that's going to be expensive to, to clean up, and you hope that it doesn't happen too often on the weekends. I know when I was uh, an operator years ago, we used to call it pennies from heaven when we would look for that stuff to come so we could uh, get some of that overtime money. So you know, it, it, your, your pattern changes. As a highway commissioner now, you'd rather not see it come on the weekends. It would just as soon snow at 6 o'clock in the morning and end at 3 o'clock in the afternoon or you go about their business, but that's not the case. We can't control that. Depends on where you're at. That's right. Salt usage. A lot of that's been reported on the news that some communities have run out of salt or salt costs have escalated tremendously. And, and it seems to me in your short tenure, you've got your pulse on getting salt, making sure you've got adequate supplies. In fact, I know you've even helped some other communities if they're in dire straits. How is it that you're planning so effectively for getting salt here and, and how are you getting the best price? We um, base our salt usage on a five-year average. Obviously, these last two years have, have uh, taken their toll, and um, we were in a position last year where we had to go and purchase some other salt from different counties also. But this year, we felt um, we were going to bring our inventories to where they should be, and then we added some vendor reserve. Um, we have this opportunity afforded to us through the DOT, which does a mass bidding for salt. Um, every municipality, uh, that would have those, uh, that the need for salt could get in on the mass bid for the entire state of Wisconsin to, to in, incorporate that all into there so they can get the best bang for their buck. Um, there has been some communities that uh, chose to go on their own and, and felt that they were going to get a better deal that way. And uh, when the state put in their mass bid or mass order from last year because everybody's reserves and, and uh, inventories were down so far, they pretty much purchased up every kernel of salt that could go from here to Minnesota and, and into Canada. So it put a, a hardship to the people that weren't in on a state bid and in turn made their salt costs go from $47 a ton to $125 to $150 a ton. So we were fortunate to get in underneath that bid and uh, lock our price in for $47 a ton and that's delivered to our sheds. Hmm. We uh, monitor our inventories on a on a, on a weekly basis and obviously it might be even more if you have uh, continuous events after event after event so we can get our orders in. We do not have the capacity to store all the salt that we use in a year. We have the capacity for about 7,500 tons uh, currently. Um, so we watch those, uh, those inventories and we have to make sure we get our orders in in a timely fashion because obviously if we're using, so are the communities around us. And so we're all asking for the salt at the same time to be delivered. So we try to plan it and, and obviously now we, we got into a little bit of a lull where we're not using it. So we put our order in already for the next round because we have room to get it in. So we're staying a little bit ahead of the power curve, if you will, in order to get our salt in on a timely fashion so we're not scrambling like we did a little bit last year. So you've been good in that regard. The the question that comes up from time to time when you're interacting with friends or family, especially if that snowstorm just came through, is how much salt to use. Uh, we, everyone's got an opinion, and some people think we should use less, some people think we should use more, mix sand in. Uh, what, are, what are the general temperatures that salt is most effective? And then how do you go about determining whether you're going to use a lot of salt versus a little, and, and if you do mix sand or not? Through the training of some of our employees, we, um, uh, because we maintain some of the state roads also, there is a certain criteria that the state would like us to use. We gauge um, the salt usage on, on pavement temperatures, and a lot of people say, well, how do you know what the pavement is, or is there a big difference between the pavement and the air? We, our superintendents have uh, pavement sensors in, uh, in their trucks that shoots a uh, infrared ray down onto the, onto the pavement to tell us how cold the pavement is. You may have air temperatures at um, zero degrees on a, on a sunny day and you may have pavement temperatures if that pavement's just a little, uh, if it's a fresh blacktop, you can get that up to 20 degrees. Well, now it becomes more effective to use the salt. We'll gauge that on that. Obviously the colder the pavement, the more salt it's going to require to get that uh, pavement bared up. Um, we uh, we gauge our salt also on the wind conditions. We can create more of a problem for ourselves if we're going out and salting in a windy condition because when you lay the salt down, obviously when the snow blows across, it'll stick to that salt. 
and all of a sudden we start to get hard pack and hard packs harder to get off and it takes other pieces of equipment to get it off or you have to burn it off with salt which in turn uh, is going to require more salt. So sometimes it's better off for us to leave the salt off and let the traffic slow down and hopefully they can get through it and eventually that will start to wear off itself. But um, in some cases we may need it and then we have to go back and revisit those places because it is going to be a drifting or a hazard eventually. My bet is a lot of viewers didn't know that you actually take the temperature of the blacktop or concrete rather than just what it happens to be that day on the temperature gauge. Interesting. What about, what about using alternatives to salt? Sand, a mixture of both. Uh, you've even heard some communities using beet juice. What's your perspective on that? The sand um, years ago was, was effective when we were not required to bear up the roads as fast. Um, uh, through some state regulations, uh, there were some promises made that we were going to do a better job with snow removal to maybe in increase commerce and keep people moving. Um, about that time is when we made the switch from sand to salt. Um, the sand required us to go back and revisit those spots more often than it was with the salt. So that's why, because of the first three cars that drove over it kind of dissipated the sand, got it to the side, and it was not effective anymore. So there was some tests done and it, they thought it was more cost effective just to go with pure salt and try to clean it up the first time instead of having to revisit and revisit and revisit. Two more questions, I'll turn it over to Mike. Uh, how many miles of road is the uh, highway department responsible for? We have a 450 county trunk miles. We take care, we maintain 170 miles of state road and 465 miles of township road. So if you add it all together and you go by lane miles, it's about 2,200 miles of road that we have to take care of. Repeat that, please, because I'll bet you we have viewers going, wow. That's 2,200 miles of, of, of uh, one-way traffic, basically, per mile that we have to take care of. And how much of that is county, town, and state interest? 450 is county, um, 170 is state, and 465 is township. So if, if you're not going by somebody's house two times that hour, <clears throat> There's a reason for it. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen. We take care of the state, county, and then we move into the towns. So when our state guys go out, typically so do our county people, and then we just spread out from there. And then final question. Again, uh, by the time our viewers see this, it'll be likely February. We're taping this in mid to late January. And of course, the roads, we're still gonna have winter storms and some slippery conditions out there. What advice would you give travelers on how they can improve their safety as well as your operators? I guess be patient, um, give us some time, we'll get it done. We don't want to be out there any more than what you want us out there. Obviously there's a reason for us to be there. If you can't see that driver when you're behind him, he can't see you. So give us our space. The next thing is, is that I'd sooner get there late than not get there at all. So give yourself enough time and, and just be patient and, and be safe. Don't follow too close and uh, it's very difficult to drive into a whiteout condition. So if you can avoid that type of uh, scenario, then stay away from the snowplow altogether. If someone, and I said it was my final, but if someone does see something dangerous out there, a real slippery intersection or something that, you know, they're worried the next person that comes through may get in a serious car accident, what number should they call or how should they raise that to someone's attention? Notify the Sheriff's Department. It would not be a 911 call. They have a, a, a number and I don't have that with me. Um, notify them and they will in turn get a hold of our superintendents which we're on call 24 hours a day. We'll get somebody there to take care of it. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. Well, Greg, let's move past winter a little bit. I can appreciate and, that. Uh, <laughs> and, and let's talk about uh, some of the other things that you do for other municipalities. Could you give us a little background on the services that you supply them? As I had said earlier, we're the maintenance agency for the, for the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. We take care of all their state roads. Uh, and that could require anything from pothole patching to shouldering to crack filling to sign repair to center lining, uh, drainage, adding culverts, uh, replacing culverts, all the way down to paving a mile or two of road uh, with asphalt or even reconstructing some of their ditch configurations and, and, and such for the state. We do that same service for any municipality that would ask for our assistance. Besides the fact that we take care of um, out of that 465 miles of township, um, there's 11 out of the 15 townships that we service that so we just purely do all their service. When they, they call us and we'll take care of it, otherwise we'll just send some guys in there and take care of the things that are required to get taken care of as far as their maintenance goes, the grass cutting, the uh, brush removal, 
those are the agreements that we have with those people now. So <clears throat> basically anything from soup to nuts, if it has anything to do with transportation, we can, we can provide it. Now, what's the advantage to some of the municipalities in Sheboygan County if they have you do this work rather than handling a different way? First of all, if, if they were to have their own people and employees, they would have to pay that person and, the, and the, the wages and the benefit that would go along with it. Besides the fact of having to purchase the equipment that the county already owns, um, salt sheds for the start, salt storage, um, buildings and all those maintenance that goes along with those are all high cost items that when they hire us, they're gonna pay for it by the hour, time and material basis. Um, so there's no profit attached to it. Our profit is, is that we work off of our system. Anytime that we can work off of our county system reduces our reliability on the tax levy. Uh, now Sheboygan County produces a lot of asphalt and gravel. Tell a little bit about that operation and, and uh, how many tons we, we do produce on an annual basis for your projects. We produce about 80,000 tons of asphalt a year. Um, it fluctuates. Uh, last year we were at 79,000 and it had something to do with the, um, the supply. We were running, the suppliers weren't producing the liquid asphalt that we need for our product. Um, and there was such a demand for it that they couldn't keep up with those demands. So it, we got closer to the end of the year and they started to pull back on what we had figured for our, our estimate. So we were a little bit short of what we wanted to be, but we still maintained a very good year as far as asphalting goes. Our crushing operation, we produce, um, about 200,000 tons of aggregate a year. Those aggregates are, are used in our asphalt operation to, as the, um, the, the sub to the asphalt oil. Uh, we also uh, crush our road gravel and also some thicker base material, it's called three by five, that we use in an area that could be soft to, to build up the base. So our product lines are like a three eight, three eight inch gravel, half inch gravel, three quarter inch, inch and a quarter, and go all the way up to three by five. Those products are, and we sell those to our municipalities, they can use them. Um, so those, those, that's what we provide with our crushing operation. And then what kind of procedures are in place to make sure that we're being properly reimbursed for uh, these products and that are being used in the different operations? Each year we go through <coughs> our costs. Um, we initially, at, in this time of the year, we will go out for bid for our asphalt oil. So once we can establish that, that gives us the, hard, the largest percentage of our cost as it goes into the oil. From there we take and, and break down what the equipment costs are, what the labor costs are, what the fringe benefits that go along with those labor costs, we roll that all in. Besides the fact of having permitting, um, paying royalties on some of the gravel that we, that we purchase, all that stuff gets rolled in there and to, to get the bottom line pricing. Uh, we're fortunate here, we have, we have the aggregates that we need and we can produce those aggregates so we don't have to purchase a lot of that stuff outside which we, and in turn adds to the cost and the trucking of that material. We recently went through a study, an operational analysis in our, in our operation and they did check specifically if we were in, um, receiving and rec recouping all the costs that are going into it and they, it was very favorable that we were. So. Okay, and uh, currently when we um, overlay a, a road with asphalt, uh, what kind of uh, cost is there in, in, uh, to do an average mile, say, of, of, of asphalt overlay? Depending upon what shape the, the road is in currently, I mean, we have some roads that, um, that are starting to get a little bit more wheel rutted, um, where, they, where the traffic is traveling constantly in those certain areas and they're starting to get little divots there. If we need to get that in place, we could be talking any place between um, Eighty to hundred thousand dollars, and that would be getting the road into shape, going over the top of it, giving a nice level <coughs> leveling coat, shouldering it, and then center striping it. Okay, and how much does the county highway department spend on uh, maintenance and construction of just the county roads uh, during an average year? Annually, we just on our maintenance, and that would be summer and winter combined, would be about five point seven million dollars. Construction could be equal to that. Um, every year and construction when, when we rebuild a road that's everything from purchasing the right of way um, cutting the new ditches adding all the new base and then paving it so um, a lot of times we're taking our our roads from a, a 66 foot right of way which which is our clear zone and we're taking that out to 80 feet so we're widening the road considerably cutting in new ditches and, and ensuring proper drainage um, we were fortunate this year that the finance committee um, 
uh, let us uh, allow to bond for some of our larger construction projects, <coughs> which in turn gave us more money to put back into our overlays of our asphalts and our county highways. And about how many miles are we uh, overlaying currently on an annual basis? In 2008, we, uh, we overlaid, I believe it was just, just over 20, 20 miles, and um, our reconstruction was just over three miles that we did. So you can add those into as far as the overlay, goes. We, we paved about, 20, about 24 miles this year. Okay, Adam, anything to wrap up with? Well, soup to nuts. I think we've got a new uh, mission statement for our <laughs> transportation department. There's nothing we can do. We can do it all from soup to nuts. That's the way we feel. I like that. Uh, speaking of, of nuts, <laughs> you've done some good work with big projects out there, and some people might sometimes think the county's a little nuts for just how involved we get with some of these big projects, such as the town of Sheboygan. Uh, the... Rotary there. Roundabout. Roundabout, thank you. The roundabout. <laughs> there has been some controversy about roundabout, and I know some folks, frankly, don't like them. Uh, what is the, the state uh, essentially position on roundabouts, and what's the last one that the county did? What's your th feelings about it? They, they provide a very safe intersection. Um, I know it's not what everybody likes, but, you know, when you have a a stop and go light and, and a four way stop and those types of elements, there's always that, that hesitation. There's always that potential for large T bone accidents and this and that. Um, with a roundabout, when you're controlling the speeds between 15 and 20 miles an hour, your property damage is very minimal and loss of life is, is almost 100% that it's not going to happen. So they, they, they're a very safe um, improvement. The state obviously is buying into them. I believe I heard that there's going to be 195 of them in the state of Wisconsin by, I think, 2011. Mm -hmm. So they are going in all over the place. Uh, we witnessed three of them going in up on 42. The last one that we just um, uh, installed was over at the intersection of Wilgus, 40th Street, and Superior. Um, when I got here, I was told it was never going to happen. And it's currently in, and um, it was not easy. We, we got it accomplished by some cooperation between a lot of different agencies. Um, it took uh, us purchasing buildings and, and raising them and taking them down and moving the intersection and working with property owners and commercial, uh, commercial property in order to get it all done with the road got built. And um, I think it's going to be a functional piece of highway. I haven't heard a lot of complaints about the roundabout. Um, our forces built it. We worked with the uh, property owners along there to make that make sure that everybody could get into the businesses. Obviously, we had some delays some days, but uh, for the most part, it went pretty well. We, so we're not nuts. No, no. It's I, a good thing to do. In fact, in Europe, I think it's very common. Yes, is it, it not? Yes, it is. I, I, I continue to hear from people that you know they don't care for it or it slows down traffic too much. But from a standpoint of safety. Uh, the evidence has shown it is a safer form of transportation and it's more cost effective than having lights, is it not? Yes, it is. I mean, the maintenance alone, you don't have to have anybody going back there to, uh, uh, you know, they have to paint the poles, they have to change the light bulbs. You always have that opportunity for somebody to run it over or get hit by a snowplow. That has happened. Um, the maintenance isn't there anymore. We have to light them. I mean, we have to have street lighting around them, but uh, those are things that, uh, that are a necessity. It's not something that... Uh, uh, we have a lot of control over. So as far as the maintenance goes, we plow them, we keep up with them. I haven't heard any issues with that. Um, and you're going to see a lot more of them coming. Mm -hmm. uh, we are planning one for our uh, county trunk OK and EE. That's uh, been an intersection ever since I've gotten here. I've had a lot of uh, correspondence with people that they'd like to see improvements done there. We we feel it's going to be warranted and it'll be a very good place for one. Now you've mentioned, you've just talked about a critical project in the town of Sheboygan. You're t OK in the future. Uh, how do you go about determining where you're going to invest your limited resources? I mean, we can't we can't do it all. How, how do you plan that out? Traffic patterns are are developed, and you, you you try to improve the sections of road that obviously have greater potential to develop. Um, you need to rely on on um, the traffic counts that we get from the DOT um, in talking to other individuals that, that, are, that know the county a lot better than I do tell me that, you know, they, this is just starting to grow and we need to do something with this piece of highway. And we start to develop a pattern. We go by traffic count is what it is and, and what, the, what condition the road is. If, if the pavement's getting to the point where it's starting to deteriorate to a point where we need to make some improvements, 
let's do it right. And if it needs to be widened and rebuilt and improvements need to be made as far as um, the drainage, we should take care of it. And that's how we do it. So very quickly, in a couple of minutes we have remaining, for the past year in 2008, what were the key construction projects that the county highway department completed? I know, I know that we did probably more work, more work than our average year. We did. Um, we rebuilt 2.4 miles of County Trunk V from County Trunk I to the Town of Linda, uh, Linden uh, town, li town Line, um, which was uh, about a three and a half month project for us. We relocated a road over at the airport, Metal Arc Road, for the runway expansion, and we rebuilt County Trunk O from Taylor to I-43. Um, there was numerous other projects in between there that we had taken care of, but those were the most time consuming that we had to get out of the way. And then for the year ahead? We are looking to build a phase of County Trunk O from uh, State Highway 32 to Woodland. Um, we have some work to do for the planning department on the old plank trail, uh, rebuilding from Range Line Road out to 32 where we intend to get to there. We have some betterment projects for the um, towns of Plymouth and the town of Holland. And there's others. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> One that um, you didn't mention, but I know you've certainly helped a lot with is the Morgan Aircraft development going out at the airport. Uh, you and Chuck, the airport, the highway department, just a tremendous good working relationship there. And I think as we speak, you've got a crew out there at the airport getting the ground ready for them to break ground on their new facility this spring, do you not? That's correct. We, um, uh, with the county owned airport, uh, the county's uh, responsibility is to get that hangar site to a certain elevation so that it, it meets the rest of the drainage course that the airport has set forth. So our department's out there raising that to the proper height and from that point on Morgan will hire another contractor to do their other earthwork and potentially hopefully start building in March which we're on schedule to do right now. We should be finishing by mid next week with um, the parts that we had to take care of. So it's, it's been a cooperative effort and, and everybody's worked together real well and I think it's going to be a great, um, a great thing for the future of Sheboygan County. Just prior to this meeting, in fact, or, or this taping of this program, Chairman Vanderstein and I were at a meeting talking about economic development and that we need to be planning accordingly and, and of course, with the state of the economy, both in Sheboygan County, throughout the state of Wisconsin and nation, we need to gear up and the Morgan aircraft development at the airport is just a tremendously exciting opportunity up to 2,000 jobs in the future and, and the work is underway so it's, it's really encouraging and good cooperation from the highway department our airport department and and uh, the community well Greg thank you for joining us today appreciate the nice overview on the department and your roles and responsibilities uh, next month we're going to have another important department head with us Charlene Cobb from Veteran Services uh, Charlene is a new name and a new face to Sheboygan County. As you know, certainly those of you who have followed this program over the years, we try to focus on a different department every month. We have 22 departments, about $139 million budget, 1,000 employees, and a lot of very good uh, leaders in place, such as Greg. Greg, I think the highway department has, what, 114. 114 employees, so a lot of responsibility. Well, the Veteran Service Office is the other extreme. It's a two-person department, and Charlene Cobb is our new veteran service officer. She follows on the heels of Jim Riesenberg, who was a long-standing and very good veteran service officer. So we're looking forward to Charlene being here. You can get to know her a little bit better, and I think she's been on the job now for a little over three months and hearing very good reports about the service she's providing. So looking forward to introducing her to you. So until next month, and on behalf of Mike Vandersteen and the Sheboygan County Board, thank you for joining us.